Hi class. Today I want to explore uh, themes of love, romance, humanity. Uh, we'll talk also about uh, Professor Ernst's discussion of Sufi music and dance, which very much comes into um, the sociality uh, or um, uh, social relations having to do with uh, love and, and uh, feelings of friendship uh, in the Sufi tradition. Some Sufi orders allow or even encourage music and dance, uh, which are not always art forms or strongly appreciated and more uh, fundamentalist forms of Islam. Uh, and even among Sufis, these practices were frowned on by the Naqshbandi and Qadari orders. Uh, recitation of Sufi poetry is often accompanied by musical instruments and, and uh, people move around, uh, whether uh, spontaneously or sometimes, you know, when they're chanting, they can hyperventilate a little bit. They go into a slight trance and then and they start moving that way. Or in some Sufi orders, as with the Mevlevi, there are prescribed choreographies, uh, ritualized movements that take place. Um, according to uh, Burhanuddin uh, Gharib, uh, in, in the explanation of Professor Ernst, uh, there are four types of worshipful melody and uh, the, the, in Sufism, using one's voice melodiously is termed sama or audition. And so it's not called technically singing. Um, but um, there are rules for it. So listening to audition uh, requires that the, uh, the individual listen only for God. Uh, and um, not become interested in the singer uh, himself or herself. Um, and uh, that's lawful. It's permitted if the listener mostly, according to Burhanuddin, longs for God and only a little bit for the creatures. So you might have an admiration for uh, the singer or the people who are dancing, um, but uh, mainly your focus is on God. And it's disapproved if you're mainly interested in the creatures and a bit in God, and it's forbidden if you're not longing for God and only for the creatures. So if you're entranced by the singer uh, and that's why you're listening, then that's not really Sufism anymore. It's just listening to music. Um, In the Sufi tradition, one of the effects of audition uh, can be the achievement of a spiritual ecstasy, an alternative form of consciousness, uh, the technical term in Sufism is wajd. Uh, but this can only be attained if uh, one has pure intentions. Um, and. Uh, those Sufis who get too worldly and take money from rulers, uh, they, they give up this opportunity for, for this kind of uh, ecstasy. Uh, and they can't be tempted by carnal desires. Uh, they also have to uh, be honest and pure and not pretend to experience uh, this uh, form of consciousness, this ecstasy, when they really didn't. Um, and um, I've, I've been with Muslim congregations where emotion was expected, and my friends have told me that there are you know, ways to provoke that emotion without, without actually achieving it, if you can't achieve it. And, uh, but this is frowned on in Sufism. Um, modern Sufi 
uh, gatherings can be mixed gender, uh, but uh, traditionally, of course, uh, the Middle East was a gender segregated society. And indeed, there was a lot of segre gender segregation throughout Asia, India, for instance. Uh, even in the 1980s, when I was living in India, um, there were difficulties about mixed gender uh, gatherings. Uh, but in, uh, in, in the medieval period, uh, the participation of women in Sufism was quite wide, widespread uh, from all accounts, but uh, often they would have female-only gatherings. And there would therefore be female leaders at those gatherings. So it was an opportunity, the gender segregation actually made an opportunity for uh, female leadership to emerge. Um, for some Sufis, breaking into dance was spontaneous. Uh, they achieved this ecstasy. They started moving around. Um, uh, in, among the Chishtis in North India, uh, or the Meblevis in uh, Turkey and some of the Arab world, they had a particular style of dancing that was a little unusual. Most orders simply moved spontaneously. I attended a, a, a Sudanese uh, expatriate Sufi gathering in Cairo one time, uh, and they moved around uh, where they were chanting. There, there didn't seem to be any choreography. It was just a, uh, <clears throat> a spontaneous movement. We're showing you here a picture of the Mevlevi or whirling dervishes uh, who follow Jalaluddin Rumi. Uh, and they have become uh, a kind of tourist attraction in, in Turkey, in modern Turkey, where for a long time Sufi performances had been outlawed by the 20th century secular government uh, as a kind of superstition and uh, something that would hold the nation back. Now they've been revived, but mainly uh, for the uh, sake of, of tourists who are visiting. Uh, and again, in the modern uh, displays of Mevlevi dancing and whirling that I have seen in, in Istanbul, they actually are gender mixed. And so the women, uh, women are also performing. Uh, again, I, I think this would have been unusual in pre-modern times. Um, so Sufis have a metaphysics of audition. Uh, they see the uh, sacred timber of the voice of the uh, singer as uh, evoking that question that God posed to humanity uh, according to the Quran before time, uh, before the universe existed. Uh, he asked his future creatures, am I not your Lord? And they said, yes, uh, and uh, assented to him. And so it's that primal question of uh, who is the Lord uh, that, uh, that the Sufis think the audition is, uh, is, is echoing. Um, Professor Ernst uh, argues that Sufis say God placed a secret fire uh, in the breasts of the future human beings at that time, which now is ignited uh, when they hear the, the audition. Uh, Junaid of Baghdad, one of the early Sufis uh, who lived in the ninth century, uh, said, whenever they hear a beautiful voice, their spirits tremble and are disturbed by the memory of that speech. There are regional traditions of audition uh, in northern Pakistan and no northern India and in Pakistan. The ad audition is referred to as uh, kavali or kawali, uh, performed as a, a ritual at Sufi shrines uh, or on religiously significant days. Uh, and uh, sometimes the Sufi masters will plan a sequence of songs to gradually produce a series of mystical experiences in listening to the, uh, the audition. Uh, this uh, uh, Kawali has become enormously popular uh, in uh, 
modern times, uh, not only in India and Pakistan, but also uh, in uh, Europe and, and, and the Americas, uh, where um, they've, had a, they've had a great influence on film and music. Uh, you, you might not notice exactly what it is, but in some films uh, uh, like Dead Man Walking, uh, with Sean Penn, uh, there, there's Kowali in the background at a certain point. Uh, it's, it's used in Bollywood films. Uh, and um, it's been received in, in the West as folklore or world music. Um, so um, uh, there's a popular Sufi song, uh, Dama, uh, Damast Kalandar, uh, which is about uh, Othman Marwandi. Uh, who died in the 13th century and uh, was originally from Afghanistan but settled in Sahban in, in Sindh uh, and became known later on as uh, Lal Shahbaz Kalandar. Uh, he is called the Red Bridegroom or Chule Lal. Must in Persian means drunk, but in this uh, case it means drunk on God. Uh, sort of uh, having these alternative states of consciousness going in and out, getting intoxicated on the divine. Um, calendars were uh, typically wandering Sufis. They would move from place to place. Uh, they would beg often for a living. We've discussed them before. So I'm going to uh, play for you a little bit of uh, uh, Damas uh, Kalander. Uh, this uh, famous and very popular song, which uh, developed through the medieval period in the great Punjabi Su Sufi Bulay Shah is said to have put the final touches on it. That's Nusrat uh, Fat Ali Khan, uh, the, the great uh, Kowali singer who uh, is, uh, is advising uh, people uh, speak of, uh, of the Must Kalander of Lal Shahbaz. Um, well, you can see that uh, this, this music is lively and um, 
I wanted to say a few things with regard to our subject of well-being uh, that um, uh, there's, and I, we mentioned this earlier in class, uh, that there's a lot of uh, research showing a uh, relationship between music and subjective well-being. Uh, and I'm drawing here on a, a recent work of Weinberg and Joseph. Uh, they write that music can bring on positive feelings, joy, relaxation, empowerment. It's found to reduce stress. Uh, and uh, becoming an, um, absorbed in music is also a strategy for dealing with problems. When people, when they face an obstacle in life, often sit back and relax to music that they like, and it seems to help them work through the obstacle. Uh, it also, uh, if, if people listen to it together, which we're not allowed to do right now, I'm speaking during the pandemic, uh, that listening to music together f facilitates social relationships. Well, I, I suppose you could have a, uh, a music uh, a Zoom party or something and do it together. Uh, a big national Swedish study, study they say, uh, even found uh, listening to music is associated uh, with lower mortality. People who regularly uh, listen to music uh, seem to live longer, according to that study. And uh, we know that it regulates uh, mood and emotion. Uh, Weinberg and Joseph uh, found a, a special uh, positive correlation between uh, music and well-being if people actually sang. So there is a correlation or there is a correlation in the literature uh, of music, of listening to music, lifting your mood at least, um, and uh, playing an instrument. Uh, dancing, all of these things, attending music festivals, all associated with um, uh, with uh, positive mood, increased positive mood. Uh, whether they're associated with long-term well-being is a question in the literature. Uh, these studies that are on your screen say they are, uh, and uh, Weinberg and Joseph weren't always able to, uh, to prove that. Um, People who sang together, they said, uh, had higher scores on almost all domains. The highest correlation they found uh, with uh, um, community connectedness and so forth. Now, one of the problems with these studies, of course, is the t finding statistical correlations. And uh, statistical correlations are not the same as causality. So they can't prove that uh, sing-alongs, joint singing together, necessarily improves well-being, uh, but they uh, uh, they find that people who do that also report high levels of well-being. Now, it could be that you know uh, these are activities that are associated with people who are anyway well-adjusted and well-off, have a lot of friends, and so forth. But um, uh, they also found that. Um, uh, people who went to music uh, events together, uh, concerts, uh, had higher well-being, uh, and those who dance do. Uh, so, uh, you know, these, these findings, again, you can't uh, prove causality, uh, but it is suggestive. Well, returning to uh, to love and uh, and Sufism, uh, which is um, uh, which is the the rest of our lecture today, I think I'm inclined to uh, to leave uh, uh, the, this part of the lecture here, uh, so that you don't have to sit and listen to uh, one uh, one um, long lecture uh, all at once on on, on the video. Uh, I'll take up a philosophy of love in, in Islam when I return. Uh, but just to, to sum up uh, what we've covered so far, um, 
Sufi orders, uh, unlike uh, Salafis or more uh, very conservative Muslims, uh, value forms of music, forms of dance, and um, and you know when you get beyond just the order itself, the kind of formal structure. Uh, Muslim crowds have often highly valued these activities uh, and associated them with uh, the festivals of saints and public uh, performances. Uh, someone like uh, Nasr Qadali that we saw uh, would would have enormous crowds when he performed in Pakistan and, and then later on in the United States. Uh, so uh, th these activities have been I would say as a historian, you know, a big part of Muslim history. And uh, they were disapproved of uh, by very conservative Muslims in places like Saudi Arabia in the last couple of centuries. Although, interestingly enough, uh, today's Saudi Arabia is beginning to evolve and be much less conservative in these regards. And so uh, there are now uh, big uh, rock concerts and uh, in, in Jeddah, uh, which are uh, mixed gender. And I have to tell you, as someone who grew up in the 20th century, it's really hard to imagine this happening in Saudi Arabia. And these are not Sufi events, but they're, uh, they're uh, mu public musical events, even in this most conservative of Muslim societies. Uh, in the rest of the Muslim world, let's say Egypt, Pakistan, Indonesia, public performances, uh, uh, are routine, uh, but uh, where Sufism remains vital, as it does in West Africa, in Morocco, uh, Pakistan, India, uh, Indonesia, uh, also these Sufi forms of uh, of music and dance uh, remain uh, popular and, and widespread. Um, and uh, we see from positive psychology maybe uh, some of the reasons for uh, the ways in which the wisdom traditions have chosen out these uh, uh, these uh, practices in the sense that they do seem uh, to be uh, associated certainly with uh, elevated mood. Uh, they make people at least momentarily happy. Uh, but it's also possible that regular participation in them uh, is associated then with overall sense of well-being. And the Swedes think uh, listening to music, uh, and, and, and this is after all a form of music, uh, even has physical benefits and somehow is associated with uh, longevity. Uh, so um, I'm going to leave uh, this uh, lecture here, and we'll come back and go on.